Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Kravitz, Director of UC Center Sacramento. Welcome to our weekly speaker series. Um, today we're addressing a, obviously a highly timely and topical issue. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ridden on high-speed rail in other countries? So anyone with their hand raised at least, and probably a lot of you who aren't raising their hands have had to wonder um, why we've been so slow in developing such options in the United States. And, uh, obviously, of course, this has been a, a very controversial issue in California. So today, to uh, help us uh, grapple with some of the issues surrounding high-speed rail is Professor Anastasia Lucaitu Sederas. Um, she's Professor of Urban Planning and Provost for Academic Planning at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Policy. Um, Professor Lucaitu Sederas uh, is the author of many publications and several books, including her most recent with Karen Chapel at Berkeley, another UCCS speaker and a member of our advisory board. Uh, books entitled Transit Oriented Displacement or Community Dividends, and it's really um, about some of the issues that she's going to be covering today. Um, the professor is also a consultant to many government agencies, um, and she's a, a graduate terms of her PhD work from the uh, University of Southern California, which shows that it is possible to get it right eventually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we'd like to welcome Professor Lopez of Sidera. Thank you. I always feel a little bit guilty that my degrees are from the other school, but uh, I was an international student at some point, and so didn't have a fellowship for all the years that it took to get a number of degrees from USC. So, um, it is really a pleasure to, to be here, and I didn't um, realize that uh, there are going to be so many people, so that's, that's fantastic. And I think I want to thank you because it seems like you know, a number of our brightest students, based on the discussions we had uh, before this meeting, are here and taking courses from you, so that's, that's excellent. I also thank you for rescheduling my talk. I was to come when uh, there were fires were raging and the air was very bad and some of the campuses, Davis, was closed. So we rescheduled, but then think, things happened, uh, mostly the governor's comments about high-speed rail. So I felt that I had to really readjust a bit of my talk. But basically, the idea is the same. I really want to address with you uh, some work that I have done over the number of years to, to address the question of why, why really California, after so many years of, and I don't know if you know that California started discussing about high-speed rail 23 years ago, that the California High-Speed Rail Authority was um, uh, created in 1996 why we still do not have high-speed rail, why this project in, in a corridor that assumingly is ideal because there are so many hundreds of um, flights connecting the north and the south, why we still don't have high-speed rail. So I will do this by really looking into what has worked and also what have been some mistakes in other countries and primarily Europe. There is a lot of interest in China, but in many ways it is not a fair comparison to compare the United States with China. It is a very different system. The state controls the land over there. But I will compare with a number of European um, examples. And I want to say that oops, uh, here is a kind of a quick timeline of uh, 1996. We have the establishment of the California High Speed Rail and the first discussions about how do we connect uh, our centers, very popular centers, which is something that transit wants to have these connections, um, with a high-speed uh, train. Uh, in 1999 is the issuance of the first preferred corridor plan, uh, but nothing much happens for almost a decade because there was no funding associated with these proposals. Then in 2008, uh, proposition 1A uh, passes that gives $9 billion in general obligation bonds for high-speed rail. And some more money 
comes uh, in 2009 as part of the um, rec uh, rec Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And then even some more funding uh, appears uh, in 2014 uh, when uh, Governor Jerry Brown, a proponent of this project, allocates revenue from the cap and trained program. 2015, in January, construction breaks. Uh, 2019, we have Governor Newsom comments that has a number of people wondering about the future of this high-speed train project, although there is, uh, according to newer comments by the governor, he said, no, it's not the end of the, of, of the project. Even from the very start, this is a very controversial uh, project. Um, there were a lot of debates around finances, and especially the fact that when the, the general obligation bonds were approved, there was a completely different uh, forecasting of what the project was going to cost. Um, there were debates about the economic and environmental uh, benefits of the project, if we're going to lose too much farmland, where the station should be located, where construction should start from, are the cost projections accurate, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, in the meantime, I would say that. Uh, okay, excuse me. The Europeans are building a high-speed, a very dense high-speed rail network. Uh, actually, the first uh, European city to build such a network is uh, France, 38 years ago. Spain celebrated its 25th year, and they're still making these networks quite, uh, quite dense. Um, a much more recent entry to the high-speed rail network comes from China that opened its first service in 2008. They started the first service in 2008, and now they have 18,000 miles of service. But as I mentioned, I really don't want to compare as uh, impressive as this is, they are a very different system. So the questions I would try to address today is why are these European countries successful in developing a network, high-speed rail network, while the California project is still marred in quite some controversy? What lessons can we learn from the successes and the failures of the European high-speed rail planning? And can we apply such lessons to California? And can high-speed rail be planned and designed not only to promote mobility, but also economic development? Because I think that if the state is to invest so many billions of dollars, it is, of course, wonderful to be able to you know, connect uh, the north and the south in two hours and 40 minutes. But it has to do, in my view, uh, more than that. And so what are the factors that can influence economic outcomes? And so in, this is my uh, kind of an overview of my presentation. I will uh, talk about what are the prerequisites for the success and what we can learn from Europe. What are some common mistakes in designing and planning high-speed rail stations? Uh, what has been the impact of high-speed rail stations on station cities? And what are the factors that may differentiate some systems because we have seen some good and bad things? Uh, and I will give you some Southern California examples of kind of dreaming how high-speed rail network could work uh, and also promote more um, economic development. So I'm going to start and give you my conclusions first and then talk about them. I, you absolutely, I think, need three things. Um, real estate agency, location, location, location. Where the station is located within the city but also, where is the city location within the high-speed rail network? And how it connects to metropolitan centers? And that's why I would say that a network from Bakersfield to Fresno is not, in my view, something, and in, in my, uh, according to my studies, is something that is going to go too far. I mean, literally and metaphorically. <laughs> Connectivity is number two, and I'm talking about and I will give you details in a minute about three types of connectivity. Uh, spatial connectivity, I will explain what it means, intermodal connectivity, and operational connectivity. And I'm also talking about four geographic scales. 
the station, the station neighborhood, the area adjacent to the station, the municipality as a whole, and the region. And also very importantly, partnerships. And again, I think this is something that relates to some of the funding issues and concerns. Pattern partnerships between public sector agencies, but also between public and private sector. So let's talk a bit about uh, the location. Uh, take the city of Lille, a kind of a rather sleepy second tier city in France. Um, witnessed a tremendous economic development with the coming of the high speed rail because it became very close to London, Paris, and Brussels, taking one to two hours to reach on the train. <laughs> Um, on the right, you see how the high-speed rail in Europe compressed time and space because you see the time it would take uh, to travel from one city to the other and what is the time that it now uh, takes. So where you locate these stations on the network has a very important uh, it is a very important factor, and if you need all these stations, so you absolutely need to locate them in ways that bring them into connection with uh, major, uh, with major centers. This is an example from uh, the city of Rotterdam. That's a second tier city. A lot of studies <coughs> find that first -tier, tier cities get a lot of the benefits, but you find also second tier cities that uh, if they are well connected to the primary cities. And so this is Rotterdam that saw quite a lot of development and the high-speed rail acted as a catalyst for economic development in the city. Um, so it is not only first-tier cities like Amsterdam or Brussels or Madrid or London that benefited, but some second-tier cities such as Lille and Rotterdam, Saragossa, Ciudad Real in Spain that saw quite a lot of economic development. Did this happen everywhere? Absolutely not. Um, this is um, the station, Epps Fleet High Speed Rail Station, um, which is outside uh, London. It is a peripheral station. The station was not built. It was built in a Greenland, as you see. And years after the coming of the High Speed Rail, all the station has are huge parking lots around it. So the second issue that I think is very important is connectivity. And the three types of connectivity I'm talking about are spatial connectivity. How do you integrate the station with its immediate surroundings and the region? How do you make it a place that is accessible? You have a kind of an important physical barrier that are the tracks. Um, so that's spatial connectivity. Intermodal connectivity means how do you create a station that is a transportation hub that relates to other transportation modes from pedestrians to cyclists to trams to trolleys to bus systems and also how do you not only have these modes but you integrate them in terms of timing so that you get off the high-speed rail station and your metro line, your, or your tram comes within five or ten minutes. Something that we have not been able to do oftentimes in public transit here. Oftentimes people, the number one complaint of riders in public transit is about the transfers, about how much time they have to wait. I have actually a, an example, a personal example that I was saying earlier that um, my husband is a professor at UCI, and we live in Pasadena. And when we first, he first started working at UCI, I called up, there is a train station in Pasadena, a train station at Irvine. That was before the days of the Metrolink, but things have not improved very significantly. And I said, can you go from Pasadena to Irvine? He said, of course, by train, of course. He said, can you give me the, the, the itinerary? You have to leave at 8 o'clock Pasad from Pasadena. Fine. What time do I arrive? He arrives. Six o'clock in the evening. I said, what? 
I said, why? Well, you go to Union Station, and then you wait five hours for you know, the connection. And then once you arrive at the station at Irvine, there is no clear connection to take you from the train station to the university. So absolutely no intermodal connectivity. Um, and then something that is also important. Is anybody here from uh, California High Speed Rail Authority? Good. <laughs> uh, 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 Interagency coordination and co-governance. I, I, how do you create an entity that is going to build this big infrastructural project, probably one of the biggest in the state, you really have to coordinate with other stakeholders, uh, other, other agencies, other municipalities. So people are not in the dark, but also do not start opposing the project. That's something that happened in France, for example. They create this public corporation that includes representatives of all the station cities and of all the relevant agencies, etc. It is very important for a project to, of this magnitude uh, to happen. So let's talk a bit about spatial connectivity. It should be, when it, we talk about high speed, a, speed rail, it should be achieved at these four different scales. How you arrange things within the station, how the station integrates to the station neighborhood, but also to the municipality. Because if you arrive by high speed rail station, chances are, let's say you arrive in LA, you may need to go somewhere 12 miles away from LA. It is not the immediate neighborhood. So how do you integrate it? But also, how do you integrate it with a broader region? What are the appropriate stations on the network? Uh, do we need a station at Palmdale? Do we need a station at Gilroy? What are, how do these stations, if they exist, complement the other stations? All this is at the regional level, and this thinking and integration needs to happen. Uh, this is from a uh, uh, diagram that the authority had issued, it primarily talks about the station adjacent zones of influence, which are important, but you need also the integration at the other levels. Let me talk a little bit about examples. So at the station, um, this is um, the station in Madrid, the Puerta de Atoca station. And there is a lot of these stations take the uh, successful ones, because I mentioned there are a number not successful. But the successful ones treat the station not only as a place where you go and you leave, you wait for your train, you leave, but as a place where you can go and do other activities. There are restaurants, there are cafes, this is a kind of an exotic gardens. Uh, so people, travelers go to the station, but also others who are not travelers, because the station creates, you know, the spur for economic activity and opportunity becomes a landmark in the city. So you provide retail and cultural services, good wayfinding and good signage in, in the station, smooth passenger flows, um, and there can be escalators and elevators, but a lot of attention of how do you take people from, from the platform to their next destination. It could be within the station or outside the station. I had published an op-ed a few years ago at the LA Times that I was saying, build landmarks, not stations. And I was exaggerating, of course, but um, good architecture and building a building that it is a kind of a jewel for the city. Uh, some European stations have done this. This is the Rotterdam uh, Central. This is the station in uh, Belgium. They used well-known architects. At the station neighborhood, the connectivity and the integration, coordination of land uses around the station areas. This is from the Hanover station in Germany that connects with a pedestrian promenade to a commercial area. Creating and putting land uses that are major traffic attractors, meaning pedestrian traffic, um, such as important public buildings near the stations. Attention to bicycle and pedestrian connections. In, in, uh, good integration of the station to the surrounding street network, because some people, especially in the US, are going to come by car. Um, quality of the adjacent real estate. 
Um, these are examples from Berlin that show that even in an elevated station, they have managed not to create a barrier in the city, but quite smartly created these um, cafes uh, underneath the train lines, try to, to break out this barrier effect that the trucks are creating. Uh, quality of public space. Um, emphasis on the pedestrian environment, where separation, making it easier for pedestrians and bicyclists to reach their destination. You see in Amsterdam that uh, tunnel, that it is a pedestrian tunnel and a separate uh, bikeway. And so here are some examples uh, in Rotterdam that along with the station they created a wonderful square and a public space for the city that brings a lot of, a, a lot of people. Intermodal connectivity is the, the second type of connectivity that is also very important. This is from, um, I believe it is Dresden, I haven't put that, but it's in, in Germany, uh, where you see that there are buses and trolleys in some of these successful stations. The main bus terminal is within the high-speed rail uh, terminal. So there is this seamless integration of the different transportation modes. Uh, within the station, again, remember we're talking about the different scales, uh, it, is not, it is an easy walk to transfer from one platform to the other. Um, there is a lot of information, information panels within the station, easy to read signs uh, for in-station and station district wayfinding. You come out of the station, you're in the neighborhood. You have to know where you're going. Um, this is another view of a figure, a, an image that I showed you, the bicycle and pedestrian tunnel as a way to reduce the barrier effect. You see that the trucks are occupying this space. They have created this bridge that you can cross them and connect to, to the city. Um, of course, it is Amsterdam, we know that they love bicycling, but I cannot think why at some point the California High Speed Rail Authority requested 6,000 parking spaces in places like Gilroy and in Barcelona that has ridership that High Speed Rail in California would never be able to reach has 900 parking spaces. So forget about Holland, that people love their bikes, but finding ways to promote some green means of transportation so that not, and particularly, not putting so much emphasis on 6,000 parking spaces. It's a huge amount. It's extremely costly. Connectivity with local metro and tram systems. Uh, locating these systems at a convenient distance from the uh, rail. Again, this is the Hanover station. You see, you see cars, you see bicycles, you see car rental services, car sharing services, all located at a very convenient distance. And because there was a lot of discussion about the competition with the airline. In the successful cases in Europe, they have found a way to integrate the two systems in ways that benefits. Uh, so you can think, for example, a station at Berbank, people from the Central Valley getting on the high-speed rail, coming to Berbank and taking the airplane and going to other parts of the United States. So what they have done here is they integrate the ticketing. It can be one ticket. But they have done um, more than that. Uh, they, you can drop your luggage and pick it up, not at the end of your high-speed rail station, but at the end of your final destination. So if then you're flying, they, you, are not, you don't have to worry about your luggage. It is going to be transported to your last destination, which kind of integrates the two modes in ways that are comfortable and convenient for the traveler and make the two systems work in parallel and you know kind of reinforce one another. Um, purchasing of tickets, extremely convenient. 
four different ways, at service counters inside the station, ticket machines, um, online, at home, via phone apps, paperless ticketing. There is real-time travel information for all these, these modes. And so the, the last type of connectivity that I want to discuss is the operational connectivity. And this has to do with the coordination among the different agencies of the public and um, the, of the public sector and the development of a public corporation to manage this large infrastructural project with representatives from different agencies. This has not happened at all. And there were cities that very late into the game found out that they're going to be station cities. With very few exceptions, cities have not planned to accommodate high-speed rail. And when we're talking about economic development, it is not simply that you know we will plan it and they will come. You really have to prepare for that. You really have to create uh, plans in terms of how to take advantage based on your local economy, the position of your city in the network, a number of things. This has not happened. This coordination, or I call it operational connectivity, has not happened. And also, we did not see partnerships with the private sector, which we find a lot in, in Europe. So for example, Renfe, the Spanish transit operator, has a particular deal with the largest mall developer, shopping center developer in Spain. And they locate, when they build a station, the developer undertakes some of the costs of the station building and also locates a shopping center there. I'm not saying that this is always the best solution, uh, but finding ways to incorporate some of these partnerships so that the private sector can undertake some of these costs, but the private sector needs to have some stability in terms of what is coming and when in, in order to invest. And this has not happened. I don't mean to give the idea that uh, the Europeans know everything or you know, got it everything, they got everything right. We find a number of mistakes. Um, some of them have, again, with the th remember the three things that I mentioned, location, connectivity, partnership. So inappropriate station siding, uh, a lot of peripheral stations that are a little bit in the middle of nowhere where the land is cheaper, but they do not connect well. And one of the main advantages of getting high-speed rail is because it can bring you to the center of the city. The airports are often you know, quite some distance from the city. Um, there has not been in some stations mitigation of the barrier effect that is created by the massive railway infrastructure. And so you have massive parking lots and station buildings and the station and the tracks become a divider that kind of separates from, from the city. And this is again the picture of the Epsfleet station. Um, this, another mistake that you find sometimes is that the station is internally oriented, more like an airport, which is cut off from the rest of the city. But the successful ones are, th the station should not be an airport. It should not be internally oriented. It should be connecting to the system, to the, the rest of the city. And another mistake that I have seen is too much parking for cars and little emphasis to alternative transportation modes. Um, I have also seen stations like this in Saragossa in Spain that are very automobile oriented. They are well planned to be accessed by automobile, not well planned to be accessed by pedestrians or cyclists. And I have seen uh, stations with architecture that is very generic, very much like a warehouse, boilerplate that ignores the specificities of the local context. So I want to also say a few things about um, economic development, because we have seen some cities benefiting tremendously in that respect, in terms of economic development, and other cities that have not. And so I was interested in finding out what are some of the reasons and what are some of the prerequisites for uh, economic development. And I, I would say that the city status, first of all, 
research has shown that first-tier cities are the ones that typically benefit from a high-speed rail station, but also some second-tier cities benefit. Um, quite often, those that benefit the most from second-tier cities are those that are within a um, 100 miles from the metropolitan center, uh, that they're not because this kind of induces much more interaction. So it, there is a much better metropolitan integration. So that's one reason. The condition of the local economy. I mean, cities with pre-existing strong economies, uh, cultural assets, tourism. Uh, so for example, cities near the Alps that used the high-speed rail station to bring more tourism. Uh, Toledo in Spain, uh, cities that have cultural resources, tourism got quite a big boost. So, if because they took advantage of this new transportation system, they connected these with shuttles. They really looked into the intermodal connectivity and all that. Um, co this connectivity also, how these cities were able to reach the spatial intermodal operational connectivity played a role. Where the station was located in the city or outside the city, the debate between central and peripheral stations, and as you can imagine, the cities that really built more central stations typically have seen more economic development. And I, of course, I'm a planner, and you can say I'm biased, but I want to say that the plus important, anticipatory planning of how do we take advantage of this new transportation system? How do we arrange our land uses? How do we create partnerships? How do we build around the station? Having certain plans has very much played a role. Cities that did not make plans, have, I have not seen much benefit. They have not seen much benefit. And, you know, I'm not going to repeat myself, partnerships. So I just want to give <coughs> just a couple of examples of um, what I'm saying with some of the contents that I have been working on in <coughs> Southern California. So there is a station that one day may happen. I don't know when. Uh, uh, it might be many, many decades. But in Anaheim, that um, was going to be a high-speed rail station. And of course, Anaheim is very well known for Disneyland. Uh, almost everybody who comes to Disneyland comes by car. Uh, but it also has, this is a five mile radius. It has a number of other activities, the UCI Medical Center, the Grove of Anaheim, Honda Center, Chapman University. There are all these activities. And the station um, is going to be, so it's about three, three and a half miles from, um, from Disneyland. And it is not an easy distance. I mean, you cannot walk three and a half uh, miles. And this is how actually Disneyland expanded over the years. And one has to think of a system that can connect, because most of the people who, if the high-speed rail comes, would come uh, to visit Disneyland. And so, you know, Disneyland is, has this monorail system, was the first operated fixed guideway in the United States. Uh, Ray Burbank had once said that uh, Walt Disney is the only man in the city who can get a working rapid transit system built and turn it into a real attraction. So that people will want to ride it. So why not extend that monorail to go to the high-speed rail station and at its stops have partnerships to create housing, and to create certain commercial facilities, uh, kind of give some boost to local economic development in addition of, of Disneyland. And have the Disney company undertake some of the costs of building the station because it's going to, it is a benefit for them. It could be a partnership, you know. Um, it might sound utopian, but it is not as utopian. We had the discussion with the students about what Elon Musk is talking about, that we're all zooming through, uh, through underground two tunnels in Los Angeles. This has been realized in you know, good parts of the world. 
Um, another case is Palmdale. Again, I'm not exactly sure why Palmdale is chosen as a station city. Uh, but anyway, it is, and um, it is an ex-urban city. Anybody here from Palmdale? Um, no. Um, it is an ex-urban city, and if the station happens, one can think of ways that the city could take advantage. I'm not sure that you know, it is the right station there, but let's say it happens, the city can take advantage uh, and can provide, now it will become the ride from the Palmdale station to downtown Los Angeles becomes a 20 minute drive, 20, 25 minute drive. So you can think of building affordable housing. I mean, housing is a, um, you know, a little bit of more of medium rise housing to preserve a lot of the open space there. Kind of, this is a kind of a TOD. And you can think of people who would live there, get on the train 20 minutes, and commute to downtown if their jobs is there. Okay. I, I see the sign, so I think uh, I'm going to wrap it up, and hopefully we have some questions and discussions. So I just want to repeat that for economic development, there are preconditions. Um, connection to the major metropolitan centers. Baker to Fresno will not do this. Uh, central station location. Integration of the station with its surrounding area, what I call spatial connectivity. Significant station area improvements, and good architecture. Mixture of uses around the station. Again, it depends on the type of station. In some other work for Caltrans, I identify different typologies of stations. Not everybody will need or want to have, you know, a kind of a big mall. But there are other, that's why planning is necessary. Um, seamless connections with other modes, what I call intermodal connectivity, and public-private collaboration and coordination, what I call operational connectivity, and public-private partnership. And so, in conclusion, high-speed rail enhances mobility options and under certain prerequisites can also enhance economic and development opportunities around station areas, but this, this is not going to happen on its own and it requires careful pre-planning with particular attention to issues of station location, connectivity, and partnerships. So I'm going to stop here. And <laughs>